Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's National Mission. We're here to come alongside you as we journey through life under the cross. What does it look like to care for our neighbors in body and soul? How do we tend to our own body and soul? How can we speak up for life? And finally, how do we share the faith with the next generation? Join us as we have these conversations and learn together. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer, here with my guest, Pastor Aaron Nugebauer. Yep, you heard that right. The name is no coincidence. Pastor Aaron is my brother-in-law, so you get two Nugebauers today for the price of one. Pastor Aaron, I know you rather well, but would you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. I'm Aaron Nugebauer, also known to some as AJ Nugebauer, also known to others as the best brother-in-law ever. (laughs) <laughs> uh, because Steph Nugebauer is my sister-in-law as well. Uh, she's married to my brother, Pastor Kirk Nugebauer. I'm the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Leif, Arkansas, and I have a wife named Megan Nugebauer, and we have five children. And I'm happy to be here today with you, Aunt Stephanie, as we call you in our... <laughs> Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Aaron, what are your age ranges of your kids that might help our listeners as we talk about this topic today of fatherhood? Sure. I've got uh, five kids, I've said. I've got a daughter who's 15, a daughter who's 13, a son who is 11, a daughter who's nine, and a son who is seven. And I am very impressed with myself being able to do that uh, just off the top of my head. <laughs> That is impressive. The problem is it changes every year and like at different times of the year. So it's really hard to keep track of even with R3. All right. So we don't have much time. Let's dive right in. Pastor Aaron, what do you think the world around us, our culture, tells us what fatherhood is or what it should be like? And how is that different or the same, probably different than what the Bible tells us about fatherhood? Ooh, interesting. A big philosophical question to start with. I like it. I like it. So the idea of fatherhood specifically is, of course, associated with the idea of vocation, of the role as it pertains to a specific parent. And so uh, it's funny, you and I just off air, we're talking about sort of the distinction between parenthood and fatherhood. And There is a distinction when you're talking about it because fatherhood is a specific vocation within the role of parenting. The way that our current culture, uh, it's nothing new to say that views about gender and specific views about gender within our current culture, they seek to not have those distinctions made. And so... I would say that people look at father figures as simply a parent with a parental role when when it's being done well, it has specific and unique roles that are distinct from, say, what a child needs from a mother. And this is the complementarian idea that God has created the nucleus family and that it's sort of the, uh, the building block or the smallest unit of civilization. And as strong as that is, is as strong as any given society or civilization will be. And the father really is sort of the support beam of the family unit. If you're going to look at that as sort of a structure, then the father is the one who has to be holding it all up. He's the one who is given the most responsibility. He's the one who's given the most accountability. He is the one in that way who's also given the most Power may not be the right word, but the most authority. And as a result, there is a way that he should conduct himself that is distinct from the mother, which would be his wife, or their children. Luther talks a lot about vocation. So Mm -hmm. let's get down to specifics. If a father has been given the vocation of the support beam of the household, then what specifically is a father called to do? So if you're looking at a father, then, then you're more talking about his relationship and his vocation as it pertains to his children. Like, in other words, this isn't a podcast about being a husband. Obviously, the way that you treat your wife is integral to being a good father, but specifically we're talking about your relationship or your vocation, your role as it pertains to your children. So just looking at that, there's a million things that you could say, and I would like 
Steph, to get to a couple just fun little tidbits that I really think are like real world applications that can help people regarding fathering children. But I think the largest one, this is probably the least ironic thing. What's the opposite of ironic? It's this is the most predictable thing that you could ever have happen. You have a Lutheran pastor on a podcast and he's going to say that the most important thing is probably the distinction between law and gospel. So honestly, sincerely, unironically, in order to be a good pastor, in order to be a good father, in order really almost in any situation where you are put in authority over people and you're trying to bring them wisdom and you're trying to give them guidance, the distinction between law and gospel is super important. How, what does that look like as far as fathering goes? It looks like this. If my child is in a situation that I need to address, right? They've gotten themselves in some sort of predicament. Really, my response is going to be based on what? Well, do they need the law or do they need the gospel? And what that looks like, we just use any number of examples. So, for example, I have a child who is a wonderful little boy named Abraham. He's the best. He's great. He loves dancing. He loves hugging. He's just awesome. He's fantastic. He's seven years old, and for some reason, he cannot carry a plate of food across a room without spilling the contents of that plate all over the floor. Now, that is a problem for me and for his mother. And if there is a specific situation where I see that he's carrying a plate of spaghetti and he's carrying it on the carpet and it falls on the floor, which is very predictable and happens, that sort of thing happens all the time in our house. Now, if I look at his face and he is sticking his tongue out at me and going neener, neener, neener and going, look at what you got to clean up now, dad, then is he going to get the law or the gospel? He's going to get the law. And if I look at him, though, and I see that he's crestfallen, that despite the fact that he has done this and has been instructed not to many, many times, and I see that that really, honestly, with Abraham, he, like, you got to know your kids specifically, right? Each, each one's different. And if I look at him and I see, I know how much he hates getting in trouble. He just despises being a disappointment. And I see that he's got tears in his eyes because he knows what's coming. And, and whenever I see that, if I see that, then you know what I want to give him? I want to give him the gospel. Now, that's one silly little example, but really is a microcosm of the entirety of the idea of how we interact with others when we're in a position of authority over them is that you look at are they being repentant and therefore need comfort and need to be known that they're loved and loved unconditionally? Or do they need instead to have the application of the law? Well, that's, that's exactly how we carry out fatherhood. That's being the head of the family in the way that Christ is the head of the church. I like the practical example because that also plays out frequently in our house, too. And I'll just say as a wife and as a mother, the way that God has designed his creation is, of course, good. But I will tell you that it's such a relief to have a husband (laughs) who you can look to and be like, could you please handle this? I I always think that he has so much wisdom as it relates to parenting and apply in law and gospel. And it's a relief that as a mom, that that ultimately (laughs) we share that, but that ultimately kind of falls on him. And he's the decision maker of the family. He's where the buck stops. It's really nice to be able to look to him as the head of the household. Not only, you know, manage the spaghetti spill reaction, but also the, the real hard questions that probably come as kids get older. And so how do you deal with something with a little bit more weight from your 15-year-old when situations get not so black and white? Yeah. So that's a great question. Real quick, before I address that, I just want to follow up on something you said that I thought was was really good. This idea of, of being like, so you have a husband who has a natural advantage of being a father if being a father is a lot about making a law and gospel distinction because he literally has training in making the distinction between law and gospel because he's a pastor. This is something that's important, though, for all fathers. And I really think a good rule of thumb is just this. 
right? When you look at somebody and if you can see that they are heartbroken because they think that whatever it is that they have done will negatively affect your relationship with them in some way, even if it's just temporarily, then give them the gospel. There is going to be a time in your life. So this is, I'm talking like St. Paul says now when he's like, this isn't from God. This is just one man's opinion. But this is, I think, I think this is really important. There's going to be, and this gets to sort of, this will segue into what you were asking about as the kids get older. There's going to be a time in your life as a father where one of your kids really messes up, like messes up really bad. And, and in that situation, you're going to see them mess up and you're going to see them devastated. And if it's really bad, you're probably going to be mad. You're definitely going to be disappointed. You're not going to want to have to deal with it. And in that situation, your kids will thank me for this. Give them grace when they don't expect it. Give them mercy when they don't expect it. Tell them it's okay when they're, what they're expecting from you is anger and what you give to them instead is grace. Michael J. Fox in the movie Back to the Future, as he's ending that movie, he's leaving and he's like, he's telling his future parents, he's like, you know, and, and one day when your son's 16 and accidentally sets fire to the carpet, which is worse than spilling spaghetti on the carpet, go easy on him. Well, <laughs> this is sort of a, a golden rule sort of thing where we have a, a savior who says, I do not break the bruised reed. I do not quench the smoldering wick. Come all you who are heavy burdened and take my yoke upon you for it is light. And I am gentle with you and I am gentle in spirit. And when you give the gospel, when you see that it's time to give the gospel, give it like that. Give it like Jesus. Hmm. So, and I'll segue now into what you asked me, which is kids get older and as they get older, the rules do change. They're different beings. They're different people. And so when you're talking about having a relationship with like a 15 year old, I find it just endlessly delightful to have kids as they get older. And, and really the reason is because you can talk with them. You can explain things to them. I, I really think that fatherhood, you know, all of us want to have a moment because there is sort of an exasperation in, in certain phases of parenting um, where we want to say, because I said so, right? That, that that's what we want to say, specifically if we're dealing with somebody who maybe needs the law. <laughs> But here's the thing. The thing is, is that the things that we're telling them to do should all be good. Therefore, they should all have reason. Good is not an arbitrary thing. Like when we say that God is good, we don't mean we just do whatever he says and it's right because he's the one who has the most authority. That is all true. But we also acknowledge that God is good and therefore God's will is good. And if we can't see how God's will is good, we just need to look harder. Well, God the Father is called God the Father because it's we're fathers trying to emulate the perfect heavenly father. And our rules and our rationale should not be arbitrary and should also have a good. Now, sometimes you can't do that when the kids are two and three. Yeah. Sometimes it's got to be because I said so, right? Yeah. But the older the kids get, the less and less because I said so takes place and the more and more conversations should be able to happen. I'm following that. So, you know, conversations just <laughs> can happen in the car, you know. Teachable going... moments. Yes, teachable moments. Yeah, I'm just thinking of my car rides currently, which I have younger children in, and they're mostly like that Bluey episode where uh, the kids in the back seat are asking Bandit all of these nonsensical questions. Like, that is what my car rides are like right now. <laughs> you know, like, what's the number blue kind of thing? Or what does a bunch of consonants put together spell, you know? But I can see, like, as Judah, our oldest, is growing up, I can I can see that. And you're right, it is delightful it's like ah finally like here <laughs> there's an adult in the room yes <laughs> you know that's right so you know obviously you're a pastor and a father and so this probably comes 
much more naturally to you to, to share the gospel with your kids, to share God and his and his will with your kids. But how is the role of fatherhood specifically designed to be a place where God's word is passed down and the faith is passed to generations? How does the father play a unique role in that? So we talked about like the idea of a support beam, right? Well, if if there was one thing that I would say that is very important regarding being a father is that the entire home will take its cue from you. The entire, the the atmosphere of the home the, the security of the home, really a lot of the things that like Robert Cole describes regarding a God. So security, identity, purpose, and safety, all that sort of stuff that you can look at and see, they'll all, that'll all should come from that sense that they are being given from the father in the home. And that extends to the wife as well. So how do you impart that? I think that if, if there was a one word that I could say regarding the imparting of peace within the home to the children, to the wife, to just have a sense of peace and serenity as much as possible in the chaotic world of parenting. I would say the word is resilience. And so if you want to know how to communicate the gospel to your kids, really what you're doing is in a whole bunch of different ways, you're trying to, to let them know this. Everything's going to be all right everything's going to be all right. So I went to seminary. I'm a pastor. You don't have to have all the answers all the time, which is I'd like to, to try and encourage all the dads out there listening. You're going to get what, what number is blue as a question, right? Or, or you're going to get something that's, that's a lot harder than that when kids are going through circumstances that maybe aren't their fault, but that they have to face ramifications for. And really the thing that you can communicate is everything's going to be all right. Why is everything going to be all right? Well, uh, I mean, I like to do this with my congregation, just kind of throw it out there all the time. Why is everything going to be all right? Here's why. He's risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. So you know what? It's going to be all right. And resilience is one of the most important things that you can teach kids because the entire world now, we talked about sort of like the challenges of fatherhood as it pertains to the cultural idea of what being a father is well being a person right now the idea that that is pushed on everyone is that not only are you not going to be all right but you shouldn't think you're going to be all right and in fact if something wrong happens to you instead of trying to be resilient you should be a victim and you should bemoan the fact that something bad has happened to you and you should lament it and you should try and place blame and find someone else that that can possibly uh, be the cause of this outside of yourself. And instead, like, so, so just let's take something bad happening. Uh, let's say, like, my son came home and he got in trouble at this, this didn't happen, but making something up. Alex came home and he's like, Dad, I got detention. And I go, Why'd you get detention? And he goes, Well, it's because the kid next to me was talking to me, being disruptive in class. And I was trying to tell him in response to, be quiet or we were going to get in trouble. And I was speaking second, but I was the one that the teacher heard. And so I'm in trouble. Now, here's a bad fatherly response. Oh, that's awful. You should be so upset. You should be so mad. That's the worst thing ever. I'm going to rend my tunic and cry out to the heavens as a result of this injustice. <laughs> Does that bring about peace? No, but I can see myself responding that way, which is, I, I mean, you're right. I've never thought of that. No, it doesn't yeah, bring about you, peace. It doesn't bring about peace. You know what You know what it is? Hey, Alex, everything's going to be all right. You're going to get through this? Oh, yeah, you're going to get through this. This is nothing. You can do this. It's a walk in the park. You're going to take the tension. And you know what? The, the ability to be wronged, the ability to have injustice done to you, is really a measure of peace. And it's what we should be both emulating for our children as a father. And it's also what we should be passing along because we want kids that are resilient. You want to see a successful parent. You look at their kids and bad things can happen to them and they shrug it off because that's the comfort of the gospel. It's the ability to know no matter what happens. I mean, there's a whole bunch of situations where we just got to throw our hands up and say, God is God and I am not. And I don't understand why this is happening, but I know who's in charge. And I know it's going to be okay. 
So my guess is that your parenting style, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when it comes to like what we might call family discipleship or family catechesis, your approach is kind of the doing it as we walk along, as we rise up and as we go to bed, a Deuteronomy six approach. Does your family have any kind of formal like devotional time or how do you handle that as a oh, father? My poor children. I mean, so like when you say like as you go along your life, essentially like I I just <laughs> I feel like the entirety of my children's life, like we talk about teachable moments. Uh, they may, if you asked them, they would probably say, well, yeah, that's every waking moment because we're just having these conversations perpetually. If you're looking for teachable moments, you will never stop finding them. If you want to be deliberate about something, I mean, the thing that we do, again, I don't want my kids to dread this, but, but we're deliberate in that we do family meetings. But the family meetings aren't, these aren't like, I'm one of those guys who you can ask, so within our congregation, we, we don't have monthly elders meetings. We meet when the need arises. And sometimes it may be more than once a month. Well, family meetings are not planned, but they happen all the time. And sometimes it can be something as simple as, I mean, everybody has been in this situation before and just in, in the year of our Lord 2024 and the culture that we live in, you are watching something that you think is innocent enough on the television and a commercial comes on that shows something that goes against your values and norms it very easily, right? Happens all the time. You know what that is? That's a family meeting. Everybody can hear. <laughs> We're going to talk about this. We're going to figure this out. Everybody should, in, in these difficult conversations that we have about all of these cultural things, about all of the things that our kids are subjected to when we send them out the door, you know, there's all this, there's this debate that every family has internally that every mother and father has about how much to let your kids know what's going on in the world. I, I don't, I think that there's no hard and fast rule for that. You've got to kind of take the situations as they come. But I will say for sure that if they're hearing about things or seeing things or being exposed to things outside of your presence, then you better address it. You better talk about those things. If they're seeing a, a commercial while they're watching YouTube, if they're hearing people talk at school in a certain way, all of this sort of stuff, you can't be silent on it if they're hearing about it from someone else. And so we have family meetings and they're topical. And if, if there's something that's been said, if there's something that's been heard, I mean, it can be something as simple as, I mean, this, this is an example that's, that's pretty easy. I had a kid say a word that they didn't know was a bad word. Well, guess what we had? <laughs> Family meeting. It wasn't law. It was gospel. But I want my kid to know you don't say that word. And they didn't know it before. And now they know. If you're talking about the idea of, I, I just, I wouldn't ever limit, I wouldn't ever limit teachable moments to a structure. Hmm. I would want to keep that fluid. I would want to keep that going at all times. Yeah, I hear you. Yep. No, that, that's uh, good advice. And that is something I'm learning as I'm watching Kirk parents, my, my husband, your brother, is that he's so good at recognizing those moments when I'm not. I think that maybe something about fatherhood and kind of our, our the structure of our family right now is that when I'm like entrenched in the day in, day out of motherhood, and, you know, have changed the seventh diaper and we're on the, our third outfit and, you know, suddenly it's lunch when it was just breakfast kind of a thing. I think that uh, what fathers can provide is perspective when, when they kind of haven't had like a day like full of that kind of thing. Um, it's just really refreshing to have two parents doing, doing this together and helping each other. So I guess that leads me to my question of what would we be lacking or what does society lack when we don't have strong fathers? Yeah. So, Stephanie, your comment was a great segue to that, because when you have those sort of family meetings, when you've got when you've got those things about the things that are out there in the culture, even those and even the ones that really upset us, 
we still want to keep the main rule. So if we're having a family meeting because I've just seen something on a commercial that goes against the values that we know to be true, I don't want to communicate to my kids that I am so upset about this and this is insurmountable and, and they should feel rage in the same way that I feel rage about it. Instead, the lesson is the same. The lesson is, hey, guys, this is not God's will. This is God's will and it's good. And this is why it's good. So it's not arbitrary, right? This, it's all full circle. This is, this is why this is good. But again, everything's gonna be all right. You know, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Is that what you wanted right. me to say? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. You, it's been like it's Easter, the whole podcast, right? But, and, and so, so what are we missing without good fathers? We have a bunch of people who don't know everything's going to be all right. We have a bunch of people who are anxious. We have a bunch of people who are depressed. We have a bunch of people who don't have the support beam that's holding everything up. We don't have the comforter. We don't have the one who is, because really the one who is able to say everything is going to be all right, that's strength. That's resilience. Resilience is strength. And so in a world without fathers, we have a bunch of anxious, purposeless people who don't have that sense of stability. And then that ends up, we all, we, we all come into contact with other people throughout the entirety of our day. And and the sense of unease, the, that, that sense, it, it ripples out like in a pool to everybody that we come into contact with. And so we've got, we've got whole generations of people who just have a very unstable sense of being and uneasy feeling wherever they go. I mean, you can look at everything. I mean, I don't need to tell you that that sort of anxiety is is just something that everybody experiences it and, and some people do it in almost incapacitating way people feel that way if you want to know a good thing that you can pass along to your children it's stability i mean that it's just another word for peace that's all it is and, and in a society without fathers you don't have peace because you don't have the strength of somebody telling you look Jesus is risen. He is coming back. He sits on the throne of all creation. He is the one ultimately in charge. You don't need to curse the darkness. You can be a light. You can be salt. You can be the city on the hill. Because everything's going to be all right. So in our last couple minutes here, I know this is just kind of what you live for, is I'm going to open up the floor. You've got a couple okay. minutes to just say to fathers and to anyone listening, what do you want them to know? What do you want to pass on? I'll keep I'll keep it singular. I'll keep it singular because I just I think this is the most important one and it sounds silly, but it's actually foundational. And by foundational, I mean it's the thing the entirety of creation was based on. I mean it sounds big, right? Yeah. Like back in the beginning sort of stuff. I'm ready. See my pen? All right. Awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> now, and you already know this, Aunt Stephanie, I know, okay. but but all the listeners out there. If I'm walking in Walmart. And I, I live in Arkansas, so we say Walmart. You pick your own local uh, uh, supermarket or, or superstore, whatever it is. If you're walking in there and you see a child and the child is throwing a temper tantrum and the child is throwing a fit and there doesn't seem to be a reason why, but they're just not being good. They're thrashing, they're kicking, they're spitting, they're whatever. 99 times out of 100, I can tell you the reason for that. Do you want to know what that is? That kid is tired. The child is tired. The entirety of our creation, the way that we is, is woven into us and the way that God made us is that we are creatures who need rest. It doesn't matter what stage. See, this is one of the things that you're talking about. My kids are different ages. Teenagers need rest. Fathers need rest. We are not the way that we are supposed to be if we don't rest well. And one of the things that we have done in a lot of ways is our is the sleep schedules for our children a lot of times. Uh, and the older that they get, the worse this gets. But if you want if you want to have children who treat other people well, and if we as parents want to treat other people well, being well rested 
the third commandment is not optional. We act like it's optional. Sometimes we even act like it's noble to break it. But for small children, if you see, this is oftentimes something that they don't know the ability to articulate. There's two things that kids aren't very good at articulating. They're very good saying they're hungry. They're very good saying they're thirsty. They're very good saying they want that. They're on, they're honestly pretty good about saying that they're sad. They're not good about saying they're tired. And the other thing, and I'll throw this in there, is that they're not good at saying they need affection. Hmm. So, so that's, that's another thing. If you're seeing that your kid has a need and you don't know what it is, a lot of times kids are not good about articulating the need for affection. So have your kids be well rested. Have them, you know, put them in bed early. Let them rest on days. I mean, you know, there's, I, I had a grandfather who I loved very, very much. But when I was a teenager and I would get done with school and I was not a lazy kid, this is all law gospel. You got a lazy kid, tell him to get off the couch and go mow the lawn. But <laughs> my grandfather had a no no sitting on the couch idle sort of mentality. We all know this sort of uh, stereotype. And I'll tell you, teenagers need to rest. And, and it's a command from God. You know, let's be well rested. Let your kids be well rested. Don't let them be lazy. If they need the law, give them the law. But let them be well rested. And then the other thing I would say is, Teenagers, young kids, a lot of times they need affection. They need to be lifted up and they're not able to articulate that. If you see that as a need, go give them a hug. Hmm. That's good. Uncle Aaron, Pastor Aaron, thank you so much for being my guest today and for sharing your wisdom on fatherhood with all of our listeners. It is my pleasure, Aunt Stephanie. Uh, I know we, we talk about this all the time. You're my best friend. It's awesome <laughs> that you're doing this and we're, we're besties. And uh, so it was a pleasure to finally be able to do this with you. Uh, and thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review and don't forget to click the follower subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that discusses the life God has given and the people he has called you to serve right where you are in God's mission. 